And yes, I am so happy to have Ryan Dutch joining us today. So Ryan is the head of the Applied Science Group at DataRock, which build productionized image and video analysis solutions for exploration and mining. And he'll be chatting to us about fusing core imagery and geochemistry to predict lithology and alteration. And we'll get to discover how these cutting edge techniques can turn core images into essential data. So it is gonna be a great session. I hope you all enjoy it. Yes, thanks so much, Ryan, for joining. It's awesome having you. Excellent, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, and I guess I should um, pay respects to traditional owners of the Ghana lands where I'm coming from today in Adelaide. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really about something that we do at Data Rock quite a bit, and it is a lot of core analytics, which we do as a platform. So looking at computer vision imagery, but then how can we take that information that you get from these neural networks and integrate that with all of the other types of data sets that we get down hole? So I'm going to try and hopefully show a few examples of ways that this can be used by integrating more traditional geological data sets that we get, these tabular structured data sets like geochemistry, with things like imagery to maybe lead to better predictions. So um, machine learning, let's, let's start there. It, it really is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Doesn't matter you, where you look on the news, the telly, blogs, whatever you look at, there is, um, everyone's talking about it. Things like ChatGPT, um, vision transformers, things like mid-journey and these amazing ways that you can now just generate images. Um, even things like Google Maps, they've really just changed the way that we all live and the way that we work. And it's not going away. And it's probably what it presents is, uh, you know, there's the idea that there's a bit of an existential threat here. Is, is it going to get too smart for us? I think it's a bit overblown, but the reality is it presents a really good opportunity, an opportunity for us to use these new tools um, to make our work as geologists better. Um, but it can be challenging. So this graphic here that you can see, which is totally not meant to be readable, is the is a summary, a recent summary of 2023 state of machine learning, the machine learning ecosystem in terms of the, the applications that, that are using it, the tools, um, the different data sets, different ways you can approach it. And you can see here, it's very complicated. It's enormous. It looks scary, but actually machine learning is not that scary. So, so what is machine learning? Um, I'm sure everyone on the talk here knows what machine learning is, but I'll just give a real quick sort of brief intro. And really it's just about using a machine to learn an approximation of an answer. So it's taking some data, teaching a machine to say, this data looks like this data, so can you then, if I give you an unknown piece of data, what does it look like? Um, much like the way people learn, we learn from, from doing and from seeing, you need to have a lot of data and computers are very good at taking lots of data and using that to find patterns. And so the more data usually in machine learning, the better it becomes. And the reason why machine learning is so cool is that it can actually be a really important help to us. So. It can help us to automate things that we do a lot. A lot of boring things can be automated. It can help us find solutions to problems, potentially complex problems, particularly where you've got very large data sets that as people, we find it very hard to be able to integrate very high dimensional data, like lots of different types of data. There's machines that can do it easy. Um, and this gives us the opportunity to be able to create tools that can augment and improve existing approaches now, machine learning is not going to solve everyone's problem. It's, there's not a silver bullet. It's very good at doing some specific things and making sure that you're asking the right question and pointing it in the right direction and asking it to do the right specific thing. It can be really powerful. When we talk about machine learning, broadly, there's two different flavors. Um, when, when someone says AI and machine learning, probably what everyone thinks is neural networks. This is the, the latest and greatest. Um, these, what are called deep learning approaches, use this neural network structure, which is you know, supposedly kind of modeled on the human brain to essentially take what's usually an unstructured type data set. So images, text, video, um, 
and then you use this neural network to be able to learn something about that data. And then you can use those learnings to, to do something at the other end, to make a prediction, to classify something, to find a, something within a, an image. Um, and these really are the, the, the current state of the art for this type of unstructured data. So for images and natural language, this is how ChatGPT is built. Um, on the flip side of that, we have an approach called shallow learning. This has been around a lot longer, and this is more kind of traditional machine learning approaches using st traditional statistical type approaches, things like decision trees and random forests and support vector machines. And these types of machine learning approaches are really geared towards using, really geared towards structured data. So when you think about structured data, think about an Excel spreadsheet. It is columns and rows. Um, and as amazing as it is, and as amazing as the neural networks are, these traditional shallow learning approaches are still the best approach, the state of the art for modeling tabular structured data. So things like boosted decision tree, so XGBoost, CatBoost, these are the, the best models you can use for that type of data. So what we want to talk about here is a lot of our data that we use in geology is that type of data. We have both. And so how can we bring these together um, in some sort of way? Let's talk about computer vision first. So computer vision is, it's everywhere. Um, every time you go to Bunnings, you're getting facially recognized apparently, that's computer vision. Um, in, the, the, in the geosciences, we can use this for, for lots of different things. And here at Data Rock, obviously, we do a lot of work using imagery on drill core and um, cuttings. And you can use computer vision to extract Qu um, quantitative data and information from a rock that you either you would collect, but you can't collect at the same scale. You can automate the process. And there's some types of data that you just actually can't physically collect as a person. It's just, we don't have enough people hours to be able to collect it. Um, you can train a machine to do that. Uh, other image-based image data sets like airborne geophysics, um, mineral maps from something like a TEMA or an SEM, satellite imagery, uh, core scanning type technologies, seismic data, downhole televiewers, all of these things are applications where you can apply these computer vision techniques to, to solve a problem, to classify something, to find something, to make a prediction. Um, but today we're gonna to talk about taking that approach and then integrating that with this structured tabular data. So to give you an idea about how we can get from um, an image to something that we can integrate with tabular data, we need to talk about how convolutional neural networks work. So a convolutional neural network is the, the state of the art uh, neural network architecture for vision. So you start with an input image, be that image of a rock or a flower or a person, um, and it runs through a, a series of what are called convolution layers. And those convolutions are essentially filters um, and those filters do what we call here feature extraction. They turn an image of a rock or an image of a person or a flower into its, it break it down into its constituent important parts and they represent that as numbers. So at the end of the day, an, an image is just a, a three dimensional matrix of numbers that are a bunch of color values. Every pixel has, a, has an RGB color value. So you have a, um, a three layer matrix there of RGB. So those numbers, you can run these convolutional filters through that. And then in a traditional um, network, neural network approach, those, those features, that feature would then go through a classification head, which is a, a fully connected neural network. And it's in this part where the network learns to, to make a prediction, to predict, is this rock a basalt? or not a basalt, is it a flower, is it a person, is this a face, is it a vein? Um, these convolutions though are the important part for us. So the way this works is, as I said, uh, an image at the end of the day is just a bunch of numbers. It is a, it's the way we view, uh, the way we capture images is a, a three dimensional uh, matrix with three uh, layers for each color and a convolution 
what the convolution does is it takes essentially what is a filter and it runs that filter stepwise across each of these matrices to build up another matrix, a smaller representation. And as it does that, what it's essentially doing is it's finding the constituent important parts of that image. So for example, here with a flower, we can go through the first convolutional layer. It's finding the really broad scale parts of an image. So the, the edges, something like that, the, the large, the horizontal and vertical lines. Then we can evolve that and that then find more subtle features like textures. And then we can convolve that and that can find the features that define parts of an image. We can combine, evolve that again. And that begins to build up things like objects within an image. And so each one of these steps essentially is pulling apart the representation of that image, turning that representation into a, a vector, just a series of numbers that represents the important things in that image, how we can describe that image as a number. So in traditional sort of um, neural network approaches, computer vision approaches, you would take that convolutional neural network, you would have a bunch of training data, and then you would put it to a problem. And the, 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 the traditional sort of problems and the problems that say the data platform does is things like classification, where it just says, okay, here's an image. What's, what is this image? This image contains veins or doesn't contain veins. Or well, this image is an image of a granite or it's not a granite. Um, you can then, do something like semantic segmentation, where he says, within an image, find me all of the instances of what is a vein. So here we are doing a, a segmentation and saying, every one of these pixels belongs to the class vein. Uh, we can detect objects within, within the image. Find me all of the, the object veins. And so we can find all the veins. Or we can do something a little bit more complex, which is semant um, instance segmentation where it says, find me all the veins and then classify those veins. Find me all the veins that are calcite veins, quartz veins, something like that. This is kind of the, the traditional approach that we use in the, in the platform. And this is where you're using that convolution on your network and you're going all the way from start to finish. So you're going through all the convolutions, through that um, prediction head, and then out the other end to what is essentially a classification. So an example, the platform is core imaging because we're going to talk about integrating core imagery with other data sets. So we can use the platform to take raw core imagery and, the, and the, the types of models that we've built for the platform to turn what is essentially here an, an unordered, um, unstructured mess into what are analytics ready images that we can then use. So using the data platform, we can take core imagery like this. And we use a, a number of models within the uh, within the platform that first of all finds the boxes. So we need to do a segmentation to actually say yes, this is core box and this is not core box. Then we can say find me every row in that core box, and then we can then find every row of core in that core box. Within each row, we can then run a segmentation which says find me every piece of rock in that core box. And the, what we do in the platform is we actually classify those pieces of rock. And this is important for the, for the next steps in, in the process I'm going to talk about. We find every piece of rock and we classify it as a piece of coherent rock, uh, a piece of broken incoherent rock, core blocks, um, empty tray. And what that ends up leaving us is essentially a just all of the, we can then pull out just all the rock within the core box. So we know where the gaps are. We know just for the rock. We can use this information later and I'll show you how we do that um, coming up. The next thing obviously in the, on the platform, to be able to use that information with all of the other types of data sets that we get down a hole, we need to know where that piece of rock is in the hole. And so to do that, we have to do a depth registration process. And so the platform takes the the start and the end of a drill core, of a, a core tray. And that's a, a good approximation. But the problem with that is that often you have core loss or you have um, something's gone wrong with the, with the drillers and they've put their mini marks and things like that. 
So what the, the platform does is the platform uses that information, but then it does a check. And that check is it uses an optical character recognition algorithm. So it uses OCR on the core imagery, reading the meter marks on the core imagery. And it does a bunch of smart back calculations to say, this is where I think it should be. This is where the meter mark is. This is what the core loss information says. Where should this pixel or this piece of this core actually be in the core box? And so by doing a bunch of smarts there, we can end up with a depth registered analytics ready image. And so what that means is that every pixel in this image, we know that it's rock and we know that it is just down up where we know exactly where it is down the hole. And by having that information, we can then start to integrate that with other types of data that we've got down the hole. Um, from there, you can then do a bunch of interesting stuff uh, on the platform, which is where you would do things like let's find all the fractures or the veins or do a, a lithology model. But what we want to do is use that information and then try to integrate that with other data sets that we have down the hole, like geochemistry or wireline. So in terms of what you can get down the hole now, it's it's kind of crazy actually like there is just a huge wealth of information that we can get um, down a hole and more often than not we are collecting multiple different types of data on any one hole so this includes things like your traditional logs so your litho logs your stratigraphic logs your structural logs all of these things even though they're collected by people they these are important because this is how we see the rock this is how we classify the rock um, Downhole geochemistry, assays, PXRF, things like the mineralized where you've got continuous scanning, um, hyperspectral data, all of this information, petrophysical data downhole, hyperspectral data, so it's something like a high logger, LIBS, where we can now use um, LIBS scanning to actually get geochemistry, continuous geochemistry downhole, all of the wireline logging tools that we have, so things like getting MAXUS, density, um, gamma, or doing that on the core with something like the geotech logger, doing picture physical scanning, X-ray tomography, and the huge amount of information that like measure while drilling data. This is a, the, the latest thing that's coming out. You know, we're not even collecting this on the core or in the hull, but actually collecting the data of, from the drill rig as, as it is drilling the hull can tell us really important things about what is actually happening at the end of the bit. And so it can tell us something about the geology itself. All of this information is is depth constrained. It's um, it's linked to that hole to the to the the core but all of this stuff is essentially mostly this structured tabular data it's the sort of thing that you need to model using shallow learning approaches and one of the big challenges that we have obviously is we've got this wealth of data with so much information there but ultimately when we as geologists go to core library like this or somewhere in the, in the core farm and log a hole we're actually doing it visually so we might have all of this information available and we might be using this information to some degree, but it's really hard for us as people to be able to integrate all of these different types of data into one cohesive um, story to be able to pull out the relationships between and within the data itself. There's the issue of managing different scales. It's the problem there is that many of these different data, so something like a mineralized might scan every one centimeter, an assay might be taken every meter. Um, there are there's challenges of scales and how we work between scales is a, is a real problem, and that's something that we spend a lot of time on. Um, and obviously, these different geological data sets that we're using they tell us something different about the rock, and they may or they may not be related. One of the, the common things as well is that despite having all of this information and all of these different types of data, sometimes we can't actually measure the thing that we really need, or we don't have, we have say a really high value data set, something that we need, but we can only capture it on a small percentage of the data. Something say we're doing um, some sort of density measurements or hardness for the uh, geomet processes. We might only be able to get that on a small subset of the data, but we would like that over the rest of the, of the deposit. And so how can we actually create those models? Now we can do that using these downhole data sets. But when we as geologists look at a rock, we look at a rock um, visually. So we look at a core, piece of core, and we log it using the color 
and the texture and an understanding of the structure that we see in the rock, the layering, the bedding, the features, the, the grain size distribution. None of that information is captured in these downhole things. So how can we take that vision-based stuff, the computer, the computer vision approach, the core photography, and then integrate that with these other structured downhole data sets. So we can do that by using this conversion of rocks into numbers. And so we can take that convolution layer we talked about earlier, where we're extracting the important features that turn an image of a rock into a numerical representation of the important pieces of that rock, the important information in that rock. And instead of doing the rest of the classification that says, is it a basalt or not? We can just take that information and that gives us what is essentially tabular data. It's a vector. Um, it depends on the types of model that you use as to how big that vector is, but it is just a numerical representation of what the computer sees as the important features of a rock image. Um, there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, the way that we do this often now is using a process called self-supervised learning. And that's where you have a, a neural network that doesn't, that basically learns the features, um, the important features on its own data. So it takes say an input image, and then what you do is you create an augmentation of that image. So you would take that image, you would rotate it or skew it or cut pieces out of it. And then you would say, this augmented image should look like, look like this image, learn the function that creates that. And by doing that, we can tailor this number to be a really strong representation, I guess, of the important features within the rock itself. Another way to do that, and the way that I've done it, done it here, is to use what's called transfer learning. And what that does is that uses a pre-trained neural network. So in this instance, uh, we use a neural network that has been trained on a really large data set of other images. So something like a, there's a data set called ImageNet. And so that's a, a, a collection of thousands of images from the internet of cats and dogs and cars and people and houses. And that model has been trained on that information and it's learned the important features of how to extract important information, generic information from images. And so, you can use those pre-trained neural networks to learn these vectors, or you can use SSL. In this case, I've used a pre-trained network, but there's other ways to do it. So now we have images as numbers. So let's see what we can do with it. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is a couple of examples from, from South Australia. And, and there really are, I guess I would say toy examples. You know, this is not something that I would go and put into production tomorrow, but what I'm trying to do is give you, a, I guess, a, a flavor of the types of things that you can do with this information and how adding in that visual component, that textual information that we get from the rock itself by adding in the actual physical character of the rock, the texture of the rock into this other numerical data, how that can actually improve the way that a computer can model what we want in a rock. So we're going to talk about this using the MSDP drilling program. So this was a um, a pre-competitive drilling program done by the South Australian government back in the, I can't actually remember when it was, late 20, early 2010s, late something like that. Um, and we have a series of 14 drill holes that were drilled around uh, in sort of central air peninsula. So Cummins for, Cam's not here, but Cummins is down here somewhere. Um, this is the, the the Gawler Range Volcanics province. And this drilling was based around the margins of the Gawler Range Volcanics, looking at the types of mineral systems, um, looking for the types of mineral systems associated with the, the Gawler Range Volcanics. So these are the ISCG type systems that we've got in things like Carapatina and Olympic Dam, Prominent Hill, up on the eastern side. Um, along the southern margin, we have things like the Paris um, silver deposits and some base metal deposits. And then we have the, the gold only systems, things like Tarkula and Tunkilia up on the Western side of the, the, the GRV. And this was trying to look at for some of these types of mineral systems in areas where they haven't yet been found. And so this drilling drilled 
a whole bunch of different rock types and stratigraphy. Uh, a lot of it was the Gawler Range volcanics, so a lot of rhyolites, rhyodacites, dacites, uh, some basaltic units. But we also get into some of the other, some of the cover units over here, so things like the Whale Sandstone. And then down in the, the south here, there are older units like the, um, the Sleaford Complex, which is a series of um, Archean, late Archean, early Paleo Proterozoic um, metasediments and gneisses, um, as well as a bunch of Paleo Proterozoic gneissic, um, granitic gneisses and metasediments. So we've got a real, a, a good range of rock types in these drill holes. Um, I will talk about how spatially distributed they are because that is potentially a problem for this modeling, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So what have we, what have we got here? We've got 14 drill holes and because this was a pre-competitive data set, they, they tried to collect a fair bit of data. What they don't collect is like you would on the say an exploration program in a continuous assay. They've got something like 1200, um, different full suite lithogia chem, but they are cherry picked samples across these holes. But what we do have is core imagery for all of these and reasonably good photos. Um, we have lithology logs and stratigraphic logs, which are created by the South Australian Geological Survey. They're pretty good. Um, and seven of those holes have um, continuous mineralized XRF data down the hole. And so I thought, what would be a good challenge that would demonstrate the power of using this integration of say geochemistry, tabular data set with the imagery. And I thought maybe something like stratigraphy, trying to model stratigraphy. But to get to that, you have to do a whole bunch of pre-work. Now, I know, I'm sure many of you have heard the adage that um, machine learning and data science is like 80 or 90% data prep, data cleaning. It's absolutely the case, even for a data set like this, which is was pretty good from the South Australian government. Um, there was a lot of work required to take each of those different data sets and get them together in a way that was, that they were scaled the same, that they aligned and that they were clean. So to do this, what we've had to do is we've used the, the data rock platform to take all of those images. We've processed those to extract just the core, the depth registered core images from the, those um, core trays so that we know exactly where just the coherent rock is and we're not getting things like um, empty tray or core blocks or really rubbly broken rock. And then we've turned those images, we cut those images into five centimeter tiles. So you imagine you just take, take a stick of core and then you chop it up into five centimeter image. So each photo is like a five centimeter photo of that core, each one of these five centimeter blocks. Um, we then run that through uh, what was a pre-trained neural network, in this case we used a fishing net, to extract those features, so to turn those images into numbers. At the same time, we've taken the lithology and stratigraphy logs and the geochemical data, the mineralize and the assay data. We've cleaned all that up, so we've um, handled all of the, the missing labels, the nulls, we've worked, done something with below detection limit values. In this instance, what we did was we converted it to a very low positive number. Um, we've removed elements where we've got um, high missing values. So for example, in the uh, mineralized scans, they collect um, a suite of 24-ish elements, I think it was. Most of those were nulls, many of them obviously below detection limit, some of them just didn't work. And so we've removed those ones. And then what we've done is we've merged all of these to be consistent across what was essentially a one meter interval. So we had the mineralized data at one meter um, composites and so we've created then one meter composite image vectors for those same um, for those same intervals as well as the the geochemistry and so from there we can then do a bunch of um, unsupervised analysis uh, to look at that data and then we can do the supervised modeling so what I thought I would do is I thought I'd set myself a challenge um, and I would see if we could use this information to model stratigraphy. Now, if you look at the, if you go and look at the literature, you will see lots and lots of examples now of people using downhole data to predict things like lithology or to predict physical properties. So, you know, using uh, stratigraphic logs or 
geochemical data to say predict porosity or um, density. You don't often see people trying to predict stratigraphy and the reason for that is stratigraphy is hard. Stratigraphy is obviously a very much a human construct. It is the way that we classify the, um, that we classify rocks in terms of their processes that have, that have formed them and how we group them together. One of the advantages of uh, this area is that obviously because they're in a lot of volcanics largely, most of the stratigraphic units to some extent align with lithology, not always. Um, but I thought this would be an interesting test case to see, can we actually use the textures and the information that we see in the images, which is how we essentially model stratigraphy, um, can we integrate that with geochemistry and will that help? So our data set then consists basically of seven drill holes, the ones that had the mineralized XRF data on them. Um, we tidied up the stratigraphic labels a little bit so that we ended up only having 11 basement stratigraphic units. Um, it's still quite a big model. 11 classes in a model is, is always going to be a challenge. And the big challenge here is that the data is extremely imbalanced. Now, when I say it's imbalanced, it's imbalanced in two ways. One is you can see from the, the this figure down here. So this is just the map symbol. There's a drill holes and then the map symbol. So you can see the counts in each of those data sets and each drill hole of each type of stratigraphy for each meter interval. And you can see here that this unit, say MAU, has a lot of data, whereas some of these other ones, something like um, MH, which is the Hillsborough Sweet Granites, um, they're very underrepresented. They're also very spatially distributed. So these holes, five to 14, are spread out across a very large region. They are very, and also you've got drill holes that have got essentially only one or two lithologies. So in, in some instances, here, say MSDB10, it only has two, lith two stratigraphic units within that hole. Um, MSDB13 is a single stratigraphic unit. And so this means that we can train a model, but one of the things that you would normally do when you, when you do modeling on geospatial data is you need to take into account spatial autocorrelation. Spatial autocorrelation is the, the fact that um, things that are close together are generally more similar than things that are far apart. And so to truly understand how generalizable a model would be, you need to be able to understand how that model would work presented with new data, which was far away. Um, in this instance, it's really not possible to do that because of the nature of the, the small data set and just how broadly spatially distributed they are and how stratified they are between drill holes. And so remember that when we talk about this model. This model is, is good internally. Um, this model would not be something that I would say if you drilled a new hole tomorrow, you would not use this model to predict on that, on that new, new drill hole, let's put it that way. Um, so what we end up in this data set is about 3,000 co-located image XRF label pairs that we can train a model with. So once we have all that data together, we can do an unsupervised approach. And looking at this data at an unsupervised um, way, all that is is we don't have labels. It's just looking at the patterns within the data itself. And so what we can do here is on the left, we have just the image features and on the right, we have the image features. So those image vectors plus uh, the XRF data. And what we've done here is a dimensionality reduction technique called UMAP. So UMAP is, is a bit like something like PCA where you take a high dimensional data set and you reduce that down to a smaller dimensional data set that you can visualize. UMAP is a non-linear dimensionality reduction technique. And what that means is it takes um, information, so a point in a high feature space. So in this instance, we're talking about hundreds of dimensions because we've got hundreds of columns in our data set. Points that are close together in that high dimensional data set should be close together in this low dimensional data set through this uh, UMAP dimensionality reduction technique. And so what that means is you should be grouping things that look similar. And what's really encouraging 
from just the image features is actually that is looks to be the case. So you can see here the, the colors represent the different stratigraphic units. And you can actually see that for the most part, they are starting to clump together in similar places. Now there's obviously a lot of overlap in some of these areas here, and that's overlap between things that have similar um, textual characteristics. So granites and rhyolites and things like this, we're getting a little bit of mixing. But in general, we're actually getting a pretty good distribution of these things and they're clumping together, but they're pulling apart. So that means that actually maybe this might work. Um, an interesting thing to note in this is you can see this cluster of uh, the blue ones, MAU, sitting at the back here right on its own. That's not actually um, there because of a geological difference. That cluster is there because those images that were used to make that to, the, in this data set were actually really, um, was a small group of really bad photos. They're really pixelated images. And so by using this dimensionality reduction technique, we were able to interrogate these different clusters and I could find that we've got a bunch of bad data that we could actually exclude from the modeling. And so they, those, that cluster of data points was excluded from the modeling because they were really bad images. And so what the model learnt in this instance was not something about, can you, is this a rhyolite or a granite? It actually said, this is a bad photo and a good photo. So this is a bad photos, these are good photos, and these are good photos that are showing some sort of internal structure based purely on their images. And then when you include the um, chemistry, you can see that that actually gets refined more. So bringing the chemistry in separates these groups more. So the groups are clumping, but they're being more separated. And that's saying, actually, we might be able to model stratigraphy using this information. So how do we do it? So we use one of these shallow learning approaches. We used um, a gradient boosted decision tree model, which is a, called SGBoost. And so the input data for this is the XRF, one meter composites. We use 19 elements. All of those have been CLR transformed to, to normalize and to um, manage the closure problem in, in the chemistry. Um, these are the elements that went into the mix. The image embeddings, what we did was we didn't use, so the, the feature vector for the image was actually a, a vector of 512 lengths. So that's essentially 512 columns of information that relates to that describes the rock. Um, the problem there is that there is um, a lot of features. And so often machine learning models like this, the shallow learning um, type models, often do better when their feature space is constrained. And the other issue is that many of those features were probably very um, were collinear. So they would have been related to each other. And so what we've done is we've just performed a PCA on those 512 length vector to bring that down to 30 essentially independent orthogonal components. Um, and you can see that that still captures something like 70% of the variance in that feature space. Um, and then what we have used for the labels is the map stratigraphy. So how the geologists have mapped that stratigraphic unit, for better or worse, that's how they've seeing the rock, that's how they classify it. So we're using that information. Um, now, as I said before, because of the nature of the data set, we couldn't do what we would normally do, which would be some sort of spatial holdout system to be able to set, to get a true sense of how this model would generalize in a spatial sense. Um, so what we've done is we just use a 33% random holdout. Uh, what we did do is we stratified that. So what that means is as the model iterates through its training, it only uses, it uses the a training data set, which is balanced across the stratigraphic unit. Mm -hmm. So it's not biased towards one label or another. And from that, we've tried to create an 11 class XG boost model. Obviously that's a big, uh, that's a lot of classes. Let's see how it does. So this is a very busy slide. But basically the way you can read this is from left to right, we have chem data only, image features only, and we have the combination chemistry plus the images. Um, on the top, we have essentially what is the accuracy or an error metric on a test. So that 33% holdout test data set, this is the error on that test data set. Mm -hmm. Underneath here, we have a um, confusion matrix, which actually shows you essentially what is, how the rock was labeled, the true class, so was this rock actually labeled as an ALS or an LZ? 
and then what the model has predicted. Darker the color, the better the, uh, the result. And so what you can see here is straight away that you know, the model actually performs not that bad just on the chem data, to be honest. The, the ones that have more samples, so where you have overrepresentation of a unit, obviously they perform better because there is more information there for the model to learn on. Um, where there is less, the model performs worse. But in general, we're actually getting you know, 70s to, to 90s is, is not too bad. Um, similarly, for the image features only, it actually surprisingly well. But I guess for the purposes of this talk, you can see a significant improvement in the model results when you combine those two features together. So when you bring the chemistry together with the rock texture. And I think one of the, the, the key things to think about that is, you know, we have a lot of rocks here that are lithologically very similar, which means geochemically, mineralogically, geochemically, they're very, very similar. So we have orthonices, which are classified as Sleaford complex, and then we have orthonices, which are classified as Peter Van Supersweet. Geochemically, these look quite similar, but their rock textures are slightly different. And so the advantage of bringing in this image features, the images into this model means that we can start to pull apart those um, classes significantly better. So again, this is an example, it's a toy data set. This is not something that you would throw into production tomorrow, but I think this clearly demonstrates the power of integrating that image data with our traditional geochemical data sets. Um, so, one more example. I thought what one of the uh, the interesting things that you know when we've got pre-competitive data, as I said before, is that often they don't survey for everything, and often there are is missing missing data. And one of the things here is they've done they've collected assay data, um, very good, full suite lithogeochem, but only on about twelve hundred samples, something like that. Um, so if you're an explorer and you're coming to this pre-competitive data set but you wanted to know, well, okay, I'm a lithium explorer, so I want to go, where should I go back and reanalyze this for? And I just picked lithium at random, would not be exploring for lithium out here necessarily. What could we do about that? So what we decided to do is, you know, assay data is expensive. This is a thousand assays here, so that, you know, that probably costs somewhere in the order of 10,000, $20,000 to collect, but images are free. You collect these images as you drill the holes. Can we make a model that will help us define where we should go and sample if we want to define what is potentially anomalous in this case, lithium? Now, what we've said here is, okay, um, a general background value for crustal, crustal abundance near granite for lithium is something around 25 ppm. So, okay, let's say anything above 30 ppm is anomalous. Can you train a model based on the photography that will predict where you may have anomalous lithium. So we, we tried to do this. And so you can see here that the, the samples are fairly well distributed through all of the holes. Um, there is definitely a lithological um, bias into where the highest values of the, the, the most anomalous values are. So things like uh, here we've got a, a dolomitic unit has the highest values of lithium. Um, some of the granites and the sedimentary units, metasedimentary units are higher than some of the, uh, the rhyolites and things. But can we take this data, make a model that says you're either above or below that threshold? Um, looking at the data in that um, reduced dimension space in this UMAP space, we can see again, the data is beginning to be pulled out apart, pulled apart by its image textures. Um, there doesn't seem to be a clear um, trend into where you might find anomalous lithium. So that you can see here, this is colored by lithium PPM. Although there does seem to be generally higher lithium towards this side of the diagram, but this side of the plot, in this cluster here, than there is out here. So maybe there is some sort of relationship in there to lithology um, associated with lithium, as you would hope and expect. So 
using exactly the same method as before, we created a model to do this. So input data in this case was only those feature embeddings. It was just what the rock looks like as a number. And we've created a label set where we had those 10, uh, 1000 um, lithium assays. And we've just said, if it's less than 30 ppm, it's a zero. If it's greater than 30 ppm, it's a one. Uh, we've done the same sort of holdout. This is just a binary XG boost model. And we've tuned this model using a Bayesian search. And what we can see is model actually doesn't do too bad a job. So um, up in here, we can see the F1 score, which is that, um, I guess that the balanced error. And you can see that for positive class where it's anomalous, we're getting about 65% um, accuracy on the, on the holdout training set, holdout test set, um, where you have more in the negative class, more non-anomalous lithium, it's predicting better. Um, and if you look at that in terms of the uh, confusion matrix, again, it's doing, it's doing well where you've got more, so it's predicting the true class of um, non-anomalous better than mispredicting that. Not, not as well with the, um, with the anomalous, but it's still not too bad. Yeah. There's about 60%. You know, this is something that if you've got more data, and you augmented this with more data, this model would be better. So what can we do with that? Well, we can plot that up and we can actually have a look at that. So here's two examples in these MSDP holes where we've got, uh, in this instance, we've got a bunch of the training labels within the hole. In this instance, we only have a single value at the bottom of the hole. And the interesting thing here is, well, so this hole here, MSDP7, this wasn't assayed for lithium through this section at all. But according to our model here, there's something going on here where you've got this transition zone between what is essentially up here, we've got um, these day sites and these um, agglomerated units in through here. The model is saying there's something in the image features here that looks like areas where you have anomalous lithium in other areas. And so maybe you might want to assay here for lithium. Um, similarly in MSTP12, where we do have a bunch of training data, we can see that some of these areas around boundaries between units, say in here we've got between this um, Peter Pan super suite, I believe that is, no, uh, well, whatever the unit that is there, the blue one, um, and the rest of this, which is largely nice units, around these boundaries, we're getting things that look like they could be. So this is potentially a tool that you could use to be able to give you information that you don't have um, a priori. It's something that can help you say, okay, well, if I'm gonna spend a limited um, sampling budget to reassay this, maybe these are the areas that I should go and do. And that's, in, that's informed purely by the images of the rocks um, and the small amount of training data. So that's kind of the examples that I wanted to say, and hopefully I've, I've shown enough to, to say that actually integrating imagery into a traditional approach, modeling approach to, to downhole data can actually improve the outcomes of those models. It can give you something for free, essentially, in that second model. Um, and in the first model, it shows that bringing in that textual information really allows a machine essentially to look at the core more like we would as a human, bringing in that textual information. Um, this is actually can be applied to, to more than just downhole data. Um, and we do a lot of this, obviously the, the traditional stuff we use a model to just do a classification or segmentation, but doing this approach to be able to turn imagery into numbers and then integrating that with other data sets is another way that we can build say prospectivity maps. And we've got examples of this where we've done geophysical data or hyperspectral data and modeling these very different data modalities together to produce, um, to be able to bring that information in and create a model where you're bringing in very different types of data sets, including image-based data sets with uh, more tabular-based, say, geochemistry data sets. We could also use those fe um, feature vectors to do similarity matching. So as we showed you before in that reduced dimensionality space, things that look similar, that have similar, um, the similar feature vectors, they should clump close together. And we can actually do um, similarity metrics on those and use that as a tool to say, I have a 
a geophysical anomaly that looks like this, or I have you know, a piece of core that looks like this. Find me every other piece of core that looks like this. You know, that's a really useful tool to be able to help automate, say, finding other target, doing target generation, or even being able to automate some of your, log, your logging processes and things like that. So the applications of this kind of integration of data is really, is really endless, to be honest. Um, so that's it. So hopefully I've um, sort of gone some way to convince you that machine learning isn't scary. It is here to stay and it really does present an opportunity. And that opportunity is for us to be able to do more with the data that we've got. Um, you know, the, the data platform, for example, is really good at creating new data sets, um, data sets that we traditionally collect, but also data sets that you may not traditionally collect. And you can do it quickly and fairly cheaply. Um, it allows us to integrate these different data sets together, data sets that you normally wouldn't be able to actually integrate in a quantitative way, things like a photograph of a rock with downhole geochemical data. Um, and by doing that, it can allow us to identify complex patterns and to find anomalies quicker. And it takes some of that um, grunt work off of the geologists. It gives them another tool to be able to read the rocks and it augments their ability to be able to do more than what they're currently doing. And at the end of the day, this is all about making better decisions. And so by bringing in all of these different data sets together, you're able to produce what is essentially a, a more data-driven decision-making approach. You can use all of the information that you have at hand to try and make the best decisions. Um, but obviously, you should also remember the limitations of machine learning. It is not a silver bullet. It's not going to answer everything. And often the approaches need to be very nuanced depending on the types of data and the question that you have. But as long as you define the, pr the problem clearly and understand the limitations of the models and the data and you implement them in a way that is rigorous, scientifically rigorous and repeatable, so they're scalable, but also verifiable. Um, they are a really useful tool to be able to help you actually um, do your job significantly better. Uh, and that is it for me.